Warning, this video contains flashing lights, loud noises, shaky camera movements, and pretentious filmmaking. Anyone with a strong sensitivity to any of these, or anyone who wants to feel ever again, may want to sit this episode out. <laughs> Okay, I'm only nine movies into this look at the Asylum's catalog, and I've seen some absolute crap so far, but Alien Abduction, not to be confused with the 2014 film, is one of the most unwatchable movies I've ever seen. And I mean that in a different way than it's usually used. When a movie is called unwatchable, that often implies that the story and characters are so devoid of talent, enjoyment, humor, and or taste, that counting sunspots would be a better use of our time and far less painful to the eyes. But in this case, the movie is literally unwatchable. This is one of the most nauseating experiences I've had trying to focus on the on-screen action of any visual media. I don't even have words for what it feels like to watch this thing, so here's a small sample. Bud, I wanna go camping someplace else. Do you hear me, bud? Wasn't that fun to watch? Well, just stretch that out to about 90 minutes and congratulations! If you didn't have it already, you've developed epilepsy. But is there some form of story hidden under all the annoyance? Some deep message we should focus on that the camera won't? Well, it'll take some digging, but let's cover our eyes, plug our ears, and find out anyway. Four young adults are camping out in the woods when one of them begins to see and hear strange things in the sky. She tries to record what she sees, but the camera strangely doesn't pick anything up. Later that night, the group is sitting around a campfire when they're abducted by aliens, who take them back to their ship, strap them up, and seemingly cut them to pieces. Sometime later, the initial young adult, named Jean, wakes up in a military hospital. She's kept under close guard and is forced to take medications and seemingly pointless cryptic tests. Eventually, she finds her friends, but they've all been altered, showing barely any mental function and no recognition of Jean or their surroundings. The base commander soon grows tired of Jean's meddling and disregard of orders and tries to have her lobotomized. Jean manages to escape, then begins a long, dangerous journey through the army base to find her friends and get out of there. Will she escape the control of the sadistic Major Shakti and find a way out of this hellhole? Is this mental ward an accurate representation of what it feels like to sit through this movie? So summarizing the movie, I realize that the story really isn't that bad. It's coherent, it's interesting, I didn't always know where they were going, it sounds like a movie I'd want to see, especially as part of this look at B-movie sci-fi and horror. If it was made with a more experienced crew, it might have ended up as one of the more interesting titles in this retrospective. As such, it's still interesting, but in all the wrong ways. Besides the story, this is one of the messiest, most painful movies I've ever had to sit through. I know I just got done trashing Vampires vs. Zombies for being the worst Asylum movie I've seen so far, but at least on a technical level, Alien Abduction may have it tied for worst. I know how that sounds, especially since Alien Abduction looks better than Vampires vs. Zombies, or at least has a better camera, but on a technical level, it is the worst movie I've seen from the Asylum. Hell, I've seen the shaky cam vomit-inducing mess that is five across the eyes. And I'll go so far to say that that movie isn't as wretchedly produced as this one. Oh, it was bad, but it was consistently bad. Every other minute, this movie finds some new way to make itself hard to watch, physically, technically, or both. I could just spend the rest of this review saying, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, but let's actually break the movie down and explain just why this movie is so bad. Like I said, the story itself isn't that bad. It's a bit stock, but it's what you'd expect out of a cheesy sci-fi B-movie. The plot and pacing, on the other hand, is absolutely wretched. 
It's a 20 minute story for a 90 minute film. This is a Twilight Zone episode stretched out to movie length. And even the Twilight Zone movie needed five segments to reach that running time. So to make a movie length, the beginning is painfully stretched out. The opening, before the main character finally wakes up in the hospital, lasts for nearly 20 minutes. And that time is well spent just watching stupid young adults do stupid stuff before they get abducted and we get what Charles Manson had to watch to sleep at night. Why did this have to be the first quarter of the movie? It could easily have been cut in half if not cut out entirely. We see the events of the opening scene play again later anyway, so just open with Gene waking up in the hospital and let the audience piece it together. The rest of the movie is comprised of... I have no idea! Scenes that are supposed to establish setting and create atmosphere, but just leave you feeling confused and a little dirty. Scenes just seem to start, locations just seem to change, and we're given no idea of the relation of one area with another. Seriously, the Tree of Life has nothing on how erratic the pacing is. It's almost like Scarecrow, where they just wanted to film their favorite horror tropes and somehow tie everything together, except they forgot to tie everything together! Now, it's not as confusing as I'm probably making it sound, uh, it doesn't get sidetracked for long periods of time, arguably, and the focus remains on the main character trying to find a way out in this maze of a facility. But at no point did I feel like Gene was making any progress or that one scene naturally followed another. You could toss most of the second half of the movie in a hat, shake it up, then arrange the scenes in the order you pick them out, and it would probably flow just as well. Don't get me wrong, I love surreal atmospheric movies and media. Gravity, Monty Python, the previously mentioned Tree of Life, the works of David Lynch, all crazy media that tell their stories more through subtext and imagery than dialogue. The problem is the movie can't decide how it wants to tell its story. It's very dialogue heavy, yet when it comes to anything important, we're told practically nothing. The movie has this attitude like its audience automatically knows what's going on, so exposition is kept to a minimum and anything we're shown is never explained. We're never told what these little slug things are, or why they're inside some people but not others. We don't understand what the alien hierarchy is, since we see different types of aliens, but it's not clear who works for what. This type of alien appears to be what abducted the group in the first place, but then we have one being tortured by a human, or at least an alien that resembles a human, so who's in charge? We're never given a plan, we're never given a culture, we don't know anything about these people or location. At one point, Jean finds herself in an office, where she's suddenly fascinated with papers that look like they were taken from Wikipedia, say nothing that explain her situation, and have no reason to be here given what's revealed about this location. Heck, the twist, which I won't give away, calls into question why any of this was necessary. There's also this one doctor who wants to help Jean escape, basically serving as a deus ex machina and how many times he'll pop up and help Jean out of a jam, and we're never told why. Slight spoiler, some of the humans are alien clones, but we don't know if this guy is an alien or a clone or a human that was spared to help the aliens out, like in Dark City, or why he's going to great lengths to stop the aliens' plan. Whatever it is. Look, either give some exposition to the audience about what's going on, who these creatures are, and why we should care, or leave everything vague. Tell the story through Gene and have the viewers draw their own conclusions. This movie wants it both ways. It certainly shows things happening, but we don't know why they're happening. We don't know how anything works, so we don't know if anything can be done to thwart the aliens, so we have no suspense for when things go south, so why should we care if Gene makes it out or not? Can the aliens be stopped? Should the aliens be stopped? Because it's not even clear what they ultimately want to do. When Final Fantasy XIII has a more defined world with less repetitive plotting and a clearer plan for the heroes and villains, just stop. But, comparatively speaking, the plotting is the most tolerable of the movie's problems, because things just get worse from here. The acting in this movie is abysmal, even for this tier of film. I've brought up bad acting before, but boy are we scraping the bottom of the barrel here. Everyone, from the main characters to the extras not even on screen for 30 seconds, play their parts like they were just grabbed off the street, thrown on the set, told to read the text scribble on a post-it, then were kicked back out the door after the first take. Most of the dialogue is muttered, with no hint of inflection or even understanding as to what they're saying, like the text they're reading off the off-screen cue cards are the first time they've seen their lines. 
No emotion, no enjoyment, no character, no nothing. I didn't think we'd see Vampires vs. Zombies level acting so soon, but here it is! Is there anything we can do about this? It's driving me crazy. It's meant to calm you down. Ah! Ah! I'll see what I can do. Any breach, any contamination, and I'm responsible. Just test her tomorrow. She's almost there. The only actress trying for any sort of character is the one playing Jean's friend Brittany, and well. Let's go camping somewhere else where there's like buildings and a toilet and a 7 Eleven, for goodness sake. I've never been kissing you again. Oh, uh, yeah? <laughs> well, maybe it was just inside your head from like high blood pressure or something. Oh, there. Ugh, it's just a bird, you idiot. Yeah, suddenly the dead faces don't seem as bad now. I don't know if this was the director's fault, or the actors are seriously this incompetent, or some mixture of both, but with the exception of a few admittedly decent emotional outbursts from our lead, the acting makes the happening look like a kabuki stage production starring Jim Carrey and Adam Sandler. <laughs> and you know, if I came in about a minute later, then you would be naked. And <laughs> no, no, it just drive me nuts. What? No. While there are no notable names attached to this production, at least none that you'd immediately recognize, and most of them just went on to do a few more Asylum movies than nothing, quite a few of them did have some decent screen time in well-known films. This guy, who is only credited as the director, you might recognize as the guy the Joker fries in Tim Burton's Batman. The actress who plays the main villain you may have seen as J. Jonah Jameson's assistant's assistant in all three original Spider-Man movies. And the lady playing this nurse has been in a lot of stuff. But most notably, she was the adult version of the sister from Bicentennial Man. But the most prolific actor in this movie is Griff First, who has a small role as Todd, who's written, directed, produced, and acted in nearly a hundred productions and is still going strong, including roles in Battleship, The Magnificent Seven, I Love You Philip Morris, L.A. Noir, The Founder, Now You See Me, Terminator Genesis, and a good number of other Asylum movies as well as directing Asylum movies and making his own low-budget monster flicks, so yeah, not bad at all. And I can see him having a long film career, as he's the only one giving any remote effort to his performance. These things think happen all the time. People think that they see these things and they're convinced, but you know... You see? You see how screwed up you are? Somebody put a plug in the back of your neck and now you can't even remember who you really are. Also, the director gave his kid a cameo, as a lobotomized child. Lovely. The camera is obnoxious. It's clearly shot almost entirely with a handheld, and the operator must have downed five double shot espressos before every shot because it's always moving. It's always twitching, always moving around, always cutting to random objects before immediately cutting back to the performers. And when it zooms in, it always has focus issues, rendering a shot blurry for a few seconds before the obvious autofocus kicks in. And that's before I mention the odd angles the camera likes to film in. I'll give him credit that the sets are quite large, or at least seem that way, but we never see that much of them. The camera is constantly held close to the walls of the actors, resulting in very cramped scenes that almost give a feeling of claustrophobia. The handheld camera in the movie is actually handled better than the camera used to film the movie. The camera is so erratic and unnatural, it almost felt like it was a character in itself. Some pervert who likes to sneak up on the actors and film over their shoulders. I kept expecting someone to break character and shove the guy back, tell him to respect their personal space. Actually, come to think of it, why wasn't this filmed like a found footage movie? The movie was written and directed by Eric Forsberg, who went on to write and direct several Asylum productions, including a mockbuster of Cloverfield, so this could have easily been practiced for that movie. Just keep everything from Jean's perspective as she tries to get out of wherever she's being kept. Have the audience see what she's seeing. That would have explained the obnoxious camera. That would have explained a lot of things, actually. Speaking of pervert, some of the few times we get a still, decently placed shot are for scenes where characters are naked. We get a good long shot of this one dead nurse with her melons hanging out, then a few scenes later we get over a minute of Jean cleaning herself with her hooters and badonkadonk for everyone to see. Why? What purpose do these scenes serve? At least Vampires vs. Zombies establish itself as softcore porn, but this movie wants to be taken quote unquote seriously. 
I can only guess this is the movie's attempt to be artistic, to show the shape of the human body and how beautiful it can be without sexual contact. Which I'm not seeing with that ugly green blurry filter that covers most of this movie. We later get an equally unsexy scene where this scientist just grabs this alien's ding dong and jerks it off, spraying jizz everywhere. And it's filmed like a torture scene, so even if you did find the previous scene titillating, that feeling's gone now because the movie now interprets sex and nudity as body horror, and it gets really uncomfortable. Or maybe Forsberg forgot he was making sci-fi and thought he was working on one of the Asylum sex comedies for a second. At this point, nothing would surprise me. But if the camera's not annoying enough, don't worry, the editing will help make things worse. At several points in the movie, there are instances where shots are just really grainy frames from later scenes, or even where scenes are obviously reused. For no reason! They could have just cut these scenes and nothing would be lost. Except for this one scene, where they actually forgot to film the good doctor meeting up with Jean, so they reintroduce him off screen and obviously ADR him saying that Jean's with him to get past security. Either that, or they realize they wrote Jean into a corner and couldn't come up with a convincing escape plan in time. But if the editing for the slower scenes can get confusing, I dare you to make sense of when there's supposed to be a scuffle. Seriously, watch this scene where the alien gets revenge on the scientist and tell me if you spot any connection between each shot. <laughs> the scenes aren't helped by the fact they have exactly two visual effects they use for the entire movie. We get these very uncomfortable fisheye lens shots that are used for both dream sequences and alien bursting scenes, so the symbolism is lost there, as well as this lens flare. Every time we see one of these aliens, they're covered in this lighting effect that just makes it hard to see the aliens or what they're doing. As if the shaky cam didn't already make it impossible! Heck, it's used not just for the aliens, but the opening credits. Every time a credit flashes on screen, it's with a blinding flare that never subsides and starts to burn the retinas after a while. I have never seen a more instantly repelling way to start a movie. And I've seen the past! Though maybe I should give them credit for their special effects if their physical props consist of laminated paper signs and a hand blender. Though probably not. Oh, but we haven't touched on the worst part of the movie. Yeah, the convoluted plot, the terrible acting, the nauseating camera work, the choppy editing, the blinding special effects, nor the director's disturbing fetishes were the biggest problem with this film. No, 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 no. The most unbearable part of this movie, though only a fraction above everything else, is the sound and music. This has the worst sound balancing I've heard in anything. It is never consistent. Every scene is either too loud, too quiet, or some annoying mix between the two. I mentioned how Vampires vs. Zombies sounded like all the dialogue was recorded solely using the camera's built-in mic, but with this movie, I think that was actually the case. It is never consistent from one shot to the next, and it always seems to be dependent on how close the camera is to the actors, which probably explains the claustrophobic framing prevalent in this movie. Oh, hey, hi. Oh, uh, hey. Hi. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, um, should I, should I step out or? No, no, I'm almost done, sorry. Why don't you just leave me alone? I'm only gonna cause you trouble. Because I know who you are, and I wanna help you. It's also obviously louder in indoor shots than outdoor, and by the end of the movie, the volume is blaring compared to the first shot, often blowing out the audio threshold. And nothing is done to clean up the audio, so most shots in the building are echoey to the point I instinctively started tuning it out. Where's that door lead to? Oh, that door, that is the rear access hall. That's for special areas like for garbage, um, loading dock, things like that. And sometimes the movie will realize the audio is too quiet and will suddenly get a sonic boom as the sound tries to right itself. <laughs> the music is also super distracting and quite tone deaf. As with a few other films we've looked at, the soundtrack is comprised mostly, if not completely, of royalty-free stock music. That alone is fine, I use stock music for my projects as well, but it has to match the tone. A number of times the music just randomly starts up and it's at a tone and tempo that don't match what's happening. Most distracting of all is what I think they try to pass off as the movie's main theme 
which sounds nothing like an intense sci-fi score and more like a cheap ripoff of the theme The Poltergeist. Yeah, couldn't just wait until the actual Evil Kid ripoff film, could you? Oh, but everything mentioned so far is nothing compared to the movie's biggest flub. Just take a listen to this. Will anything ever be the same again? I didn't edit that! I swear to every omniscient being that exists, I changed nothing there. They actually forgot to record dialogue for that one exchange and left it in. This, 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 this is an absolutely legendary technical fail. Right up there with that one scene in Scarecrow Slayer where they forgot to animate the actress falling. And, like that movie, this had to be intentional. Someone had to have consciously either removed that line or left the scene in, and nobody that watched it caught on. They could have quickly dubbed the line in in post-production, or even cut that shot out, but no! That unbelievable below-amateur mistake is now on film for the rest of eternity. Was... was there one competent person in charge of sound? They apparently had better recording equipment based on the shadow of the boom mic you can see in some shots, but the final mixing does nothing to show they had any idea what they were doing. I make my recordings with Audacity and a rock band microphone, and even I have better audio and music balance. And this might be the only time I can ever brag about that. My guy, Manos the Hands of Fate was more competently acted and recorded, and that was a movie initially filmed without sound. This is, without comparison, the worst scoring and sound editing I've ever heard from any professionally distributed film. Birdemic included. Just, uh, is there anything salvageable about this movie? Anything good I can say they did right? Well, like I said, the story's not bad. I could see it being used in a more competent and coherent sci-fi horror B-movie. A few times, the main actress shows some emotion, even if it's just fear and terror, which seems to be the only emotions women in cheap horror movies can show. Griff first is a bit of fun for the one minute of screen time he has, and there's this character who really has the mad scientist persona down. I guess the alien costumes and puppets are pretty cool, at least what the movie let me see of them. But no, even combined, these elements do nothing to make this movie watchable. I don't even know what else to say about this flick. I just spent more time writing and editing this summary than I have any of the other reviews I've made so far. And I don't feel accomplished. I don't feel good about watching this movie, or writing about it, or even showing the world that it exists. It's one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Not top 10 worthy, but somewhere in the 10s or 20s. It is exhaustingly amateur, beyond incompetent in nearly every aspect, impossible to focus on for even a few seconds. I can't even say it's a movie that has to be seen to be believed. I don't want to be involved in subjecting anyone to the same nauseating, headache-inducing experience. I'll give it credit for its ambition, and how they were clearly trying to make a good movie, but that just makes the experience slightly worse. Not one person had any idea of what they were doing, or even showed any sign they wanted to do it. It's the equivalent of a game designer promising an incredibly ambitious project, then stitching together something made out of pre-made Unity assets, embarrassingly novice models, and first-year bug riddled code, and claiming it's her magnum opus. I'm sure quite a few of the people working on this movie tried their best, but in this case, their best just wasn't enough. Set phasers to kill, and don't get abducted by this movie's promises. Well, I'm practically dead inside. Do we have a movie to match? Preferably with an ironic title, given how I feel? Well, alright then. Let's see if dead people result in a more lively movie. Hey there everyone, thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please consider supporting me on Patreon and help me create even more content like this. It's only a dollar to get early access to my videos, and only five dollars gets you a credit at the end of each of those videos with higher tiers offering these and even more perks. And as you help me reach certain goals, I have super special content lined up for all of you. Head on over and check out my Patreon today, and I'll see you next time.